Okay, we'll start with this. Set to go down on the undercut of Roman Gonzalez versus Julio Cesar Martinez. Australia's own Olympian blue chip prospect turned professional boxer, Sky Nicholson. She's supposed to be making her professional debut. And it has now come to my attention that she's going to be making that debut against an unbeaten fighter like herself, an unbeaten fighter with three more pro fights than she's got because Sky hasn't debuted as a professional yet. She's going to be facing Canada's own Brie Howling. Brie Ooh. Howling who sports professional record of three wins, no losses, no draws, no recorded knockouts yet, though she seems to have respectable power. Bree Howling's an orthodox fighter. Sky Nicholson is a crafty southpaw. Busy puncher, too. Sky Nicholson, she's 26 years old. To Bree Howling, who's 24, 24 years old. She's two years younger than Sky Nicholson. This is super featherweight contest. Super featherweight, that's 130 pounds. That's where Michaela Mayer holds the WBO and IBF titles. Alicia Boomgartner, she's got the WBC. And Hyunmi Choi, she's got the WBA. What is fight's taking place in the super featherweight division? A lot of people have got a lot of things to say about Eddie Hearn and his fighters. The one thing I don't think he can be accused of is protecting his fighters because he didn't protect Anthony Joshua from Oleksandr Yusik. He didn't try to bypass him. And he's not protecting Sky Nicholson here from Bree Howling. Let me tell you something. There are easier paths to traverse for Sky Nicholson to make her professional debut. This should not be confused with a bring along fight. It's this not. should not be confused with an experienced fight. That's not what this is. It's not. This is a contest, folks. This is a fight. It's kind of like how both Feruza Sharapova and Sofia Ochigwava made their professional debuts against each other. It's kind of like how Clarissa Shields and Frenchon Cruz made their professional debuts against each other. This is Blue Chip Prospect versus blue chip prospect. This could be a banana skin. Brie Howling has the look of a more experienced fighter than her record would lead you to believe because she is an experienced fighter. She comes from a Muay Thai background, having now transitioned to pugilism, to boxing. She shows the jab, and it's an educated jab, knows how to probe her opponent with it, touch her with it, and set up the shots. There's not a lot of... She's only 3-0, and but there's no nervous energy. No movement for the sake of movement. No wild flurries and arm punches. No winging of the shots. This is controlled aggression, controlled pressure. And a balanced approach, because defensively she's sound as well. I look at Free Howling, and I see a fighter that has a high ceiling, like Sky Nicholson, a high ceiling of her own. I see a fighter like Brie Howling, unbeaten 3-0 and Brie Howling of Canada. Are you sure you want to make your pro debut against this girl? You know, after that David Evanesian versus Josh Kelly fight, I remember that former Olympian Tony Jeffries, Tony Jeffries who represented Great Britain in the Olympics many years ago, he took issue with Eddie Hearn's matchmaking, the matchmaking over there at Match Room in reference to the Kelly fight. He felt that that was too much too soon for Josh Kelly. You wonder... You think they're matching Sky Nicholson too tough for a pro debut? At minimum, what I think is that she's got a live one in front of her, that you can't confuse this with a going-through-the-motions, bring-along kind of fight, an experienced fight. This ain't no club fighter. This ain't no jiny woman. Like I said, this ain't no bring-along. This is a fight. And I had heard the name of Brie Howling in the last 12 months. I heard that name thrown around, someone I might want to look out for. And now she's here, and I gotta tell you, she looks for Formidable. She's good on the outside. From the outside coming in, and she's not bad on the inside once she get there. She has the look of a boxer puncher. A boxer that lives between a pure boxer and a pressure fighter. She can apply pressure. So not being an according to Hoyle pressure fighter that works off volume. Not just activity and aggression. Brie Howling may have the appearance on paper of a novice, but when you see her in action, you see that she's more experienced. She's got the punch placement and poise of a more experienced fighter than she actually Actually is. There's no nervous energy, no movement for the sake of movement, no wild flurries, no winging of the shots. I mean, Brie Howling is a solid fighter, a solid boxer puncher, and that's who Sky Nicholson is going to be making her professional debut against. I'll tell you something, they must be real fucking confident. It's not a secret that Matchroom is very much invested in the career of Sky Nicholson. They made a big announcement when they signed her, and she's one of several other Australian-based fighters they plan on using to open up that market in the land down under, Australia. And this is who they wanted to make a pro debut against. Can't take very many educated guesses or make very many proclamations about what Sky Nicholson might or might not do in this situation because this is her pro debut. This is a genuinely intriguing situation, a genuinely intriguing matchup I'm looking forward to seeing on the undercard of Chocolatito versus Julio Cesar Martinez. Look for this 
in early March on the 5th. In other news, per tweet from my Coppinger via his sources, ought to have better beef and Joe Smith Jr. are closing in on a deal for a light heavyweight title unification this summer in New York on ESPN. The holdup is on the Smith side of things. Star Boxing offered him approximately $1.5 million, but he's looking for around $1.8 million. ESPN story coming. Lots of repercussions with this potential fight. Lots of ramifications for starters. If these two guys are in negotiations to fight each other and they can get this fight over the line, that's two less guys, two less names to badger Canelo Alvarez with. The name of Joe Smith Jr., the name of Artur Betterbeef. If Joe and Artur are unifying with each other for the time being, they're not in the running for a Canelo Alvarez fight. Awesome. Unify your division, consolidate the titles, and let Canelo fight the winner. Let Canelo fight the last man standing at light heavyweight, whoever that last man ends up being. I'm not against it. I'm glad to see the light heavyweights aren't sitting on their hands, giving themselves strangers, waiting for Canelo Alvarez to give them a call. It's very good news. As far as Joe Smith Jr.'s request for $300,000 on top of the 1.5, it seems like a small enough request on the face of it, though you have to ask yourself, what are the ramifications of acquiescing to such a request? If you end up giving... Joe Smith Jr., who's only got one alphabet title, $1.8 million. What if the art tour better beef people catch wind of that? What is going to be their reaction to that news when they're in possession of two alphabet titles and the coveted Ring Magazine belt? If you're giving the Joe's demand for more money, what stops the better beef people from asking for more money? And what's the commercial value of the fight? Where do you price it? Before you start acquiescing to everybody's financial demands. If the fight is set to take place in New York, New York York City. That's Joe Smith Jr.'s neck of the woods. That's what that is. And you'd be relying on Joe to move a lot of those tickets, have a lot of those Long Islanders, Strong Islanders, right. heading to Manhattan. I just want them to get a deal done. As far as I'm concerned, I don't necessarily think Joe Smith Jr. is off base for asking for a little bit more money. It's just a little bit more. $300,000. It's really not that much, though. If you acquiesce to a demand like that, it could give way, could give rise to other issues, other problems. We'll see what happens with that. And Joe, Joe might seem like he's in a position to haggle, but he's got a mandatory challenger in Anthony Yard hanging over his head, waiting for him. You don't do a deal with Better Beef and the Better Beef people. You don't get this fight over the line. You may end up having to fight Anthony Yard for less money in defense of your WBO title. And I'll tell you something. I like Anthony Yard's chances in that fight. I'm not telling you he beats Joe. I'm just saying he stands a chance. Stands a good enough chance that you need to think things through because you're running risks with him the same way you're running risks with Artur. If you don't do a deal with Artur that would allow you to circumvent your mandatory challenger, you're likely going to end up fighting your mandatory challenger. And that mandatory challenger is the United Kingdom's own Anthony Yard. When Oleksandr Vozdik and Artur, Artur Betterbeev fought, those two unbeaten champions over a year ago, two years. something like two, three years ago, they only got $1.5 million apiece for that unification match. And Joe Smith Jr. here today has the same number of alphabet titles that those guys did individually. He's only got one the same way Vozdik only had one, the same way that Artur Betterbeev only had one. Joe Smith Jr. here today only holds one alphabet title. That's just something to think about. Let's be honest. I'm sure that the Joe Smith Jr. people would have preferred to have won the Canelo Alvarez sweepstakes because they would have stood to make considerably more dollars, more millions, fighting Canelo Alvarez in victory or defeat. Whereas with Artur, it's just not as big a pot it is, and it's a great fight, perhaps the best fight the division has to offer at this time. It is. But you don't make the money fighting Artur that you make fighting Canelo Alvarez. Thus, they want a little bit more off the top. That's just something to think about. Though the commercial value of the fight is the commercial value of the fight. Like I always say, the commercial value of the fight is what really should dictate what the fighters stand to make from the fight because regardless of what your demands are the fight's going to generate what the fight's going to generate and what you want out of the fight may or may not fall into that bracket which brings me back to my original point if you don't reach a deal with the art to a better beef people and you don't do this fight you don't do this unification match you may be subject to a mandate an immediate mandate from the wbo against anthony yard your mandatory challenger and that fight like this fight is a risky proposition. It is a risky fight, and I don't think that fight pays 
what this fight pays. Well, maybe it does, but it comes with its own risks. You're really not out of the woods if you skip out on these guys, are you? There's another set of guys in there after what you got, too. Lions in the camp. Just in keeping with the theme of light heavyweight news, Gilberto Ramirez says, Bivol never sent a contract to my team. He is hiding. Dimitri Bivol says, I know for a fact that my team did offer Team Ramirez to fight me December 11th in Russia, and the purse offered was about the same as what I was offered to fight him on a Golden Boy promotion show. He rejected the offer. Yeah, I believe Dimitri. In the case of he said, she said at 175 pounds, I believe Dimitri because Dimitri has faced more solid fighters at light heavyweight than Zerto has. So if I'm to believe that one of these guys is being a little bit more careful than the other, I'd sooner believe it's Zerto than Dimitri. Because Dimitri faced Joe Smith Jr. He faced Jean Pascal, who likely was on the gear when he fought him. Who's the best guy Zerto fought at light heavyweight? Zerto, who said, I don't know why he's saying they offered a fight to me, but he must be really confused. To be clear, there was never a contract that was sent to my team or Golden Boy for a fight. Unlike how a contract was delivered to him and his team from Golden Boy for the December bout. Confused why he continues to be a pawn and create false narratives and tries everything to hide from this fight. It's just a matter of time before that belt comes to where it belongs. Don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. Look at how careful Golden Boy Promotions has been with Ryan Garcia. Look at how careful they've been with Jaime Munguia at 154 pounds and 160 pounds. And you mean to tell me? Look at Zerto's resume when he was a top rank. And look at his resume now that he's with Golden Boy. Where's the meat and potatoes? Where's the substance? Dimitri Bivol's got way less fights than Zerto does, but he's fought better fighters. That's just the truth. That's just reality. So in a he said, she said case, I'd sooner believe that Dimitri Bivol wants this fight. Hey, I'm not even telling you that Zerto doesn't want this fight. I'm just saying he's full of shit. Yeah, maybe he does want it now, now that he has limited options. Perhaps he is pursuing it. But if you really are pursuing it, forget the interviews, the sound bites, the quotes, and the he said, she said. For all intents and purposes, you should have Dimitri Bivol by the balls based on your rank by way of the WBA. So put the squeeze on them to order to fight and put him in a position to where he has to fight you because until you do that... All this yapping is for the birds. Zerto says after Bivol, Joe Smith is my next target since he has my belt, WBO title, that I had at 168 pounds. I am the best light heavyweight out there and it's not even close. There's a reason why these champs are scared to call my name, but soon they won't have a choice. I would end Smith in less than six rounds and it's funny because when Zerto was with top rank he could have had that Joe Smith Jr. fight he could have had that art to a better beef fight but he's the one who jumped ship and got away from all of that so he can go to Golden Boy and start talking about those guys I mean this is why I don't believe this guy he was already with the right promotional outfit to get the right fights for a light heavyweight for a champion moving up from 168 pounds set the campaign at 175 pounds he was already in the right place and he's the one who jumped ship what are you trying to convince me of that you wanted those fights but the people at top rank didn't want to make them hey, whose idea was the battle of rio grande because you left top rank to fight some fucking nobody we shouldn't even be having this conversation at this point he should just apply pressure on the wba to order to fight zerto ramirez is already in a pole position to challenge for the wba title so at this point Nix the interviews and just get your people at Golden Boy to put the squeeze on the WBA so they hurry up in order to fight. I'll move on from light heavyweight to heavyweight where Dan Raphael reports per his sources Murat Gassiev and Andy Ruiz both passed on a chance to negotiate an IBF heavyweight title eliminator with the boogeyman Philippe Hergovic. That makes seven IBF ranked heavyweights to pass so far. Next on the clock when letter issued will be Dempsey McKean of Australia and Zhang Zilei of China. And there's not a lot I can say about this because this is what I told you would happen. Andy Ruiz ain't gonna fight this guy, and neither is... Murat Kassiev ain't gonna fight this guy either. We've been all through that in a previous episode of The Relay. We have. You got a lot of guys that are protecting their name value, acting like they've got everything to lose and nothing to gain from a Philippe Hergovic fight, when in reality, in protecting what name value they have, they're depreciating in value over time. Fighters like Andy Ruiz, who isn't in world title contention by any stretch of the imagination, but this fight could put him there. The same applies to Joseph Parker. He passed on this fight before they did. These guys and their teams don't like their chances against Philippe. They're gonna say what they're gonna say. They're gonna give you a million reasons, but balls to bone at the heart of it, they just don't like their chances against this guy, and they don't want to run those risks. It might be an opportunity. 
to become the IBF's next mandatory challenger. But they've got to get through this guy in order for that to happen. And in their heart of hearts, their teams and their managers don't think they can. That's what it really is. Spare me the lofty explanations about how you ain't got no time to fight the likes of a Philippe Pergovic as if fighting someone else is going to bring you closer to a world title shot, a world title opportunity. We've reached a point to where these supposed world-class fighters and former champions are too afraid to step into the lion's den with a guy. Believe Pogovic don't even got a signature fight yet. <laughs> signature win. And he's shit out of luck trying to get one because these fucking guys, at least seven of them, in the IBF's rank standings, they won't fight him. They won't fight him. Even if they have nothing else to do, they still won't occupy not a single second, a single minute of their time with a Philippe Pergovic. It is simply too risky, and that's what's at the heart of the matter. That leaves only Dempsey McKean and Zile Zhang. And I told you already, out of those two names, out of those two guys, I think Zile Zhang is more likely to end up taking the fight because Zile Zhang himself called out Philippe Pergovic oh. by name. He says he wants that fight. He's the only guy that's willing to get in there with him. Zile Zhang, not being a spring chicken, not being on that the... That guy's almost fucking 40. Zile Zhang is 38 years old, you understand. He ain't got all the time in the world. He has to move at an accelerated rate, and that involves taking risks. That involves taking chances, because if he has any aspirations of fighting on a big stage and fighting for a world title, he ain't got all the time in the world to do it, and playing it safe won't get him there. I don't like his chances against Philippe Pergovic. I admire his ambition. I admire his gamesmanship. If he actually does end up taking on the fight that all these other guys in IBF's rank standings passed on. Zile Zhang, he's not a former champion. He's not even a blue chip prospect. I feel for the guy because I feel like he's a violent knockout waiting to happen. Well, he seems to like his chances well enough that he called out Philippe Pergovic by name, so give him the fight. It's not like anybody else wants it.